Penn State football is back. Media day and the first practice that the, uh, the Penn State media has been allowed into since 2019. And I have somebody with me who was there to see all of it. Nate Bauer, senior editor at Blue White Illustrated. Nate, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for giving us a little bit of information of what you saw on media day. How are you doing today? I'm great. What's going on, T. Frank? How are you? I'm doing well. I'm a little jealous because I was not able to be at media day or at practice. So uh, I am just as eager to hear everything you got to say about what you saw and what you heard and your impressions of actually being there. And that's a huge thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't really understand of the things you can pick up on when you're actually physically at practice and physically at media day. So I'm super excited to hear what you have to say today. And, uh, and so we can give some of that information out to the people, but just so that you know, if you are not a subscriber to blue, white illustrated Nate's full, complete thoughts on camp or at least what he wrote down for everybody and what he saw on media day and the first practice they are in our message board area of b of blue white illustrated bwi.rivals.com you have to subscribe to get that information we're gonna give you a little bit today but make sure you go check out blue white illustrated and you subscribe so you can get all that insider information not just in camp but throughout the season. And one of those pieces of inside information that we had been hearing about and that we had been tracking before the season started was the big news that came out of Media Day on Saturday that James Franklin con confirmed that Adisa Isaac is likely to miss the entire season. Now, he worded it vaguely, but you seem pretty convinced that he's going to miss the whole season from your comments I heard. So is that is that the case? What do you what do you think about that situation? And what were your impressions of that information being confirmed this weekend? Yeah, I mean, the way that that James Franklin phrased it was essentially that they don't discuss injuries unless their season ending. And uh, I'm paraphrasing here. There's like modern medicine can occasionally work miracles, but <laughs> right. Like that was the gist. Well, Always hopeful with James, but you know, the fact that he was talking about it, right? Yeah. Like you, you never know, but uh, we should start this off by saying that Adisa Isaac is very, very likely to not be available to Penn state this season. So, um, you know, yeah, that, that was something that there were some kind of rumblings about through the summer. And uh, some some puzzle pieces that started to make a little bit more sense, um, you know, uh, in terms of some of the positive vibes that the buzz, it's called buzz, that was coming for, for Nick Tarburton. Um, you know, if, if you look at that information and you look at that buzz uh, in the light of understanding and knowing that Adisa Isaac wasn't going to be available at defensive end this year, um, that, that starts to make a little, a little bit, you know, more sense. It starts to align a little bit more. So, yeah, no, I thought, I thought it was, uh, though expected still really big news. Yeah. I, you, you know, you like, think it's a big deal, right? Like you think this I, is a major problem for the Penn state defense. Yeah. I mean, you know, look like, uh, I, I never want to get carried away. Um, I think that this is a program that has developed uh, talent at that position in the past and has a history of, of producing there. But I think to lose your best piece at that position, which is a position that in my mind, and I want to get your thoughts on this, a position that in my mind is, is, is important not just for sacks, Right. It's, it's not just, right. it's not just about, um, you know, uh, finishing the year, you know, Carl Nassib with, with 16 and a half sacks or whatever, you know, whatever it is like, yeah, you, you, you have those highlight guys, those flash guys, but Jason Owe, Adafe Owe was selected in, in the first round of the NFL draft this year without having sacks last year. Right. 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 Why? Why? What is his impact? What What is the impact of having uh, an effective, talented defensive end that can control rush lanes, uh, that can keep a quarterback in the pocket, that can uh, put enough pressure on a quarterback to – maybe you're not going to get the sack, but set your secondary up to – make a jump on the ball, uh, force a quarterback into a bad decision. All of those different things, I think, are impacts that that position can bring to the field. And 
to not have that, to have to rely on a guy who at, at like we can all say, no matter who it was, right. Whether it's Nick Tarburton coming out and, and uh, creating buzz for himself and, and some optimism uh, or any of the other options that they have there. Uh, it wasn't the starter. It wasn't right. Adisa Isaac. It wasn't the name. It wasn't your, your, it was your fastball, right? Right. Right. And exactly, exactly. Not yeah. your fastball. Your fastball is off. Uh, now you are facing the prospect of the entirety of a season without having your best stuff. Yeah. So how crafty can you be? How quickly can you develop those other pieces to be effective? And to me, that's that's now uh, a major question that Penn State and obviously defensive coordinator Brent Pry are going to have to answer. Uh, you know, these next four or five weeks. What do you the What do you think? What's What's your take on this guy? So there's a couple different angles at which I see this. I I, I don't see it as um, maybe as big of a thing as you do, but I don't think it's nothing. So there's a couple factors that are important okay. when looking at this. That. So so you bring in Arnold Ebikidi because you were not convinced that Adisa sure. Isaac was going to be the guy that can carry the pass rush. So you already have a guy on the roster that has a similar skill set. And to me, that's the one saving grace, but you don't have the depth. Who's the other pass rushing specialist? Who's the other speed rusher? Everyone else that James Franklin talked about, Zariah Fisher, former linebacker, his, the reason he's at linebacker is because he's not particularly quick. He's a big physical guy. Nick Tarburton, same profile. So you've got a couple of guys already that James Franklin mentioned that are more of that power defensive end. Then you have bring in Jesse Lucada into that situation, and is he going to be an edge rusher, or is he going to be a situational blitzer? That is a huge difference between being a speed rusher and being the guy that is, you know, teams are keying on. And you're correct in the sense that it's not just getting the sacks. Penn State's defense in like 2018, 2019, that time, that golden age where they were super dangerous up front, teams had to change their game plan to to play against the the, pa the 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 pass rush of the Penn State defense. There were so many fewer deep shots. You had to make those quick underneath throws. You had to do separate things than maybe what you wanted to do. And we've seen the last couple of years when you have time to throw against any secondary. You can yep. complete more passes down the field. Now, Penn State's secondary is much stronger is of, of a unit than it has been. All the way from ja Jaquan Brisker, who looked great from what I saw of the film that we were able to see. And then, uh, you know, the corners are super talented right now. You've got a bunch of uh, four- and five-star athletes. Now, they have to put all that into production, but there are ways to scheme up that pressure. And Brent Pry has been a bit more of uh, an aggressive coach when it comes to blitzing and putting pressure on the quarterback. The part, part of that problem is that it hasn't been executed properly. It has not been, the blitzes haven't gotten home the way they should have. So, that makes it harder when you can't say we're rushing four, we're putting our two speed rushers on the out, on the edge, and we're moving one of those defense ends into three technique, and now we've got four pass rushers on the field. You can't really do that now. The other thing that I think is going to be a critical piece of this puzzle is Smith Vilbert because he has the highest upside and the most talent of any of the guys that are in the rotation. So if he hits his upside, if he hits his upside, he is potentially a better pass rusher than any of the guys on this roster at 6'6", 260 with the fluid skills and the movement and the power and the speed. But now we're getting into the ifs. And I've always said, if you look behind me, the moment you start counting your ifs for 20 years that's when you get in trouble. Now you're hoping and you're waiting for something to happen that you have no guarantee of. So Adisa Isaac had the most evidence that he could be a pass rusher, but it's not like there aren't guys on the roster that may be able to do that. It's just the question of can they get that out of those guys, and that's going to be now a harder task that John Scott Jr. has to put forward of we're a man down that we were counting on with a specific skill set, so everyone else has to hit their upside. That, to me, is the biggest thing, is that there are answers, but you feel less confident about them um, than you did if you had your full stable of players. And it does. it's unfortunate that it's before you even get into camp. The attrition right. already hit before you get into camp. 
Uh, and one area that I think is really interesting that I want to touch on now is that Zariah Fisher, Jesse Lucada conversation, because it I think it, it gets us into another interesting one about the defense in general, because there were a bunch of guys that Brent Pry talked about and James Franklin talked about as far as having positional versatility. What was your read on their plan for the defense and those guys in particular that, that are being cross-trained at multiple positions during camp? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it's there's always a question of need versus having toys to play with, right? Like having it's almost the luxury, right? When yeah, you're you're cross training these guys as a, a an insurance policy, but it also opens up your options. You're looking for as many options as you possibly can have, right? Like that's, that is to me, one of the fundamental coaching elements in football is you want uh, the broadest amount to work with uh, in p positionally with, with the, the personnel that you have uh, as well as what it can execute, right? Like Will Levis last year, I'm not, I don't want to do <laughs> too much of a tangent, but right. right. Like that was the issue. That was the issue last year is, is Will Levis came in the game quarterback and it immediately cut the playbook from what your options were. Uh, defensive coordinators at that point have the ability to narrow in on what they want to do to you because they know that there are only so many things you can do to them. Right. It's the exact same thing defensively. Uh, it is the exact same thing in terms of having uh, guys who do fit those hybrid roles, right? They they right. have uh, the option to, to, to play around a little bit. And now all of a sudden uh, you have the ability as a defensive coordinator to put offensive coordinators out of balance. Right. Uh, you, you have the ability to, to, to make them say, oh, well, where, where is this guy on the field? Because we got to keep track of him. We got to, we got to account for him uh, and what his responsibilities are. If uh, Jesse Lucetta is, just a will linebacker that's not as dangerous as jesse lucetta as a mike and jesse lucetta as a defensive end right, right. Uh, a defensive end who can blitz you or or rush the passer versus dropping back into pass coverage right or or filling run hole like all of those different responsibilities that jesse lucetta can do uh become much more powerful to penn state if penn state has the option to pick and choose its spots where it wants to use him. Right. As opposed to, as opposed to, all right, these Isaac's gone. Now this is, uh, and, and nobody else has stepped up. I'm hypothesizing here, but now we have to use Jesse Lucetta and we have to have him fill responsibilities that might not be his forte, but he does them better than the next option. Right. And the, the most recent example of, I, I have of that is Jaquan Brisker last year, right? That, that was what ja Jaquan Brisker had to do to start the season was he was Penn State's best option uh, as a free safety, even though he's not a free safety. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's and that's that's what they're playing with now is, you know, they're, they're going to have to try to balance. OK, how much of. How much of their personnel is ready to play right now? Right. Versus how much of it are, is not, and how much are you going to have to make adjustments to where you put guys on the field uh, against what their best attributes are? Yeah, and that was one situation they were in last year where they did not have that. And you saw Jesse Lucada in coverage more often than you'd like. You saw guys out of position. And what Brent Pry said on Saturday of accentuating their strengths and hiding their weaknesses. There are no perfect players. There are no players that are that have no weaknesses. Some have fewer, and some can do everything at a certain level but they can't do everything exceptionally well. And the ones that do, we all know who they are. They're all, they end up in the Hall of Fame, right? You know, if yep. everything breaks their way. One guy that I, I thought was a really interesting and smart 
player to put in this conversation because I've had this discussion of Jonathan Sutherland has been mentioned in this conversation for that free safety position. But if you look at his game, his snaps and his alignments and everything and his abilities, he's not really a free safety. He's not that field safety. Right. So the idea of cross-training him at Sam Linebacker, that yep. solves two problems to me. First off, it keeps one of your special teams captain, one of your veterans and leaders engaged in defense, and it solves a little bit of the depth problem at that linebacker position. If you've got two guys, maybe it's not technically a linebacker, but if Curtis Jacobs isn't the only guy you feel comfortable with that isn't a corner in the slot, now you've got Jonathan Sutherland. I think that's a better role for him, kind of being that creeper around the box who can play in underneath zones. And I still don't think it's it's perfect having him potentially in, in slot coverage against if a team puts their best receiver there. But you want to hide that as much as possible, and you, that's where you know game planning and all that stuff comes into play. But it gives you that flexibility. That, I thought, was an interesting one. Keaton Ellis at both safety positions, I think, as you pointed out, gives you the flexibility to not be a man down at any point. Um, and then uh, we'll see what happens with some of the other guys that we talked about with uh, Zariah Fisher and with Jesse Lucada. I'm interested to see if they're a little bit more multiple in the in the coming months where traditionally Penn State has been a four down front now they have done a little bit of of uh moving around recently but now they're collecting these linebacker types that play defensive end they may be able to drop a little bit I'm interested to see if that's kind of a a trend where they're going to go to a couple more three down fronts with guys that have that drop versatility that'd be very interesting for me to see so I'm that's one of the things that I'll be looking for going forward in the season as far as do they add a new wrinkle to that defense because as you pointed out if you're predictable either in in your uh, alignments or in your personnel that's something that offenses can take advantage of you can't always be just one thing uh, yep. another thing that I want to talk about uh, before we get to that though because we're talking about the season, we're, we're right in the middle of it now. We're previewing the 2021 football season. The 2021 Penn State football preview issue is here. 166-page, full-color magazine, the comprehensive guide to the Nittany Lions' upcoming season, packed with exclusive content, including interviews, features, opinions, and analysis. Learn more at bluewhiteonline.com or by calling 800-421-7751. One of the biggest questions that people have, Nate, and you know this more probably better than anybody, is what's the quarterback situation? It's one of the big things you touched on in your, uh, in your notes at bwi.rivals.com. Give us your impression, because you talked to Taquan Roberson. Again, we have that video on our YouTube page. What were your impressions of him and the quarterback room in general from what you saw at practice? Yeah. Well, there, there, there are a couple of things, right? Uh, Taquan has confidence. He's he's excited for the season. I, I, I don't think that there's any question he knows he's – the number two, he has to fulfill that role. He has to be ready for that role. Uh, and I think that there's a reality, given what happened last year, and just in general, right? Uh, that position is susceptible to injury. There's a good chance he's going to have to play some football this year. <laughs> right? Will Levis is gone. Uh, Will Levis would have fulfilled that role this past uh, this season if he had not transferred. But he did, and so that's it. It's either Taquan Roberson or Christian Bayou. Uh, that, that the, those are Penn State's options if Sean Clifford, for whatever reason, is not able to play uh, at any point this season. So, you know, I think for Taquan, it's simply a matter of, hey, man, uh, uh, you know, you have to learn the system. You have to know, you know, you have to know all of these things that Mike Yersich wants you to do, but also you've got to be able to project and be the confident guy uh, that can rally a team around you. And that was actually one of the things that I think Will Levis did pretty well. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of confidence in him. His teammates all liked him. It, you know, that, that was, that was an element that I, that I'm curious to see how that plays out. If, Taekwon is needed this season. And obviously the caveat to that, or the addendum, the compliment, is how thin they are at that position. 
Yeah. I, I mean, uh, that it, was the part just, that just, stuck out to me is I hadn't thought about it that way. How thin yeah. it is. It's just, it's just, um, you know, and, and look, like, I, I think people are asking questions right now as to how, you know, how, how did Penn State, James Franklin, let it get this way? Well, James Franklin didn't let it get this way. The transfer portal let it get this way. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, it, it's just, it's just uh, an evolution of the game that's happened so quickly. And if you're losing pieces in the transfer portal, but can't find the right fit, the same fit doing the same avenue you know through the transfer portal then you're you're kind of out of luck you just uh, you know i'm not really sure what you do at, in the sense of yeah you might be able to make a move in the transfer portal and bring somebody in but how does it disrupt what you already have right right if at all and, and that's one thing that I, I wanna I wanna push back on when it comes to this particular perception is first off, Penn State just got to the point where they are active in the transfer portal. They had not been to this point. And they're a program under James Franklin that as you just pointed out, finding the right fit is more important than finding anybody. Right. So right. your James Franklin has been very specific about how he wants to use the transfer portal. It's not just finding guys that had talent that they, you know, they think are good players. It's about do we have a relationship with them? What's the situation of why they were leaving? Why do they want to come to Penn State? Are they a fit? Will we bring in a problem when we think we're bringing in a solution? Because we've seen at places that have brought in highly recruited players that were malcontents previously, it sometimes doesn't work. Shocker. So right. the idea that it's this thing that it everyone's looking for the the little nugget, the little grain, the little insight as to like, okay, this means this about this. And everyone wants to say like, this is what James Franklin let happen. And it's like, well, you know, yes, but also no. It doesn't one doesn't have to correlate to the other when it comes right. to this is some indictment on what quarterbacks think of James Franklin. It's what do quarterbacks think about themselves and their potential and do they want to wait? And right. that's to me, that's one of the biggest things is I've always said this whenever someone says something and you you kind of listen to it and you hear it funny and it doesn't seem to make sense typically that means it's more about them than it is about you like when people say stuff that's typically what it's about and i don't think that it has to always mean something grandiose when we see these situations I, that's at least my look at it totally no i mean i i just I, there, there are so many dominoes in play and and personalities to manage it's it's you might have a perfect fit, but what if he's a redshirt sophomore, just like Roberson? Yep. Are you willing to let Roberson leave over that? Are you sure? Like, do you know that this guy is better than what you already got? Uh, and so it's, to me, the class distribution is a huge part of it as well, is you want somebody that can slide in and fill the role without disrupting everything else you have because if if you if you bring in one and lose two you've lost right you you right. you've lost uh and so that i mean I, I just i i looking back at penn state's scholarship depth and just depth in general i mean that's that's the second piece of this is they, they have four bodies at that position uh you know and I'm not saying that normally it's seven or eight. It's not. It's typically five or six. So yeah, maybe it's just maybe it's just one that's off. You know, instead of having two walk-ons, you got one. But really, instead of having four scholarship guys, you got three. Yeah. And instead of instead of two walk-ons, you got one. And so that it's just it's just it's just jarring. Yeah. To see so few quarterbacks, and it really it really brings to attention, you know, just how, how precarious of a, of a situation it, it really is for Penn state, a quarterback. It, it's, it, you know, look, beat a dead horse city here, but yeah, Sean Clifford, Sean Clifford, Sean Clifford, Sean Clifford. We cannot talk too much about him and his season because so much of what Penn state does is, is attached to him and his health. 
Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, I, I think, a perfect segue. Nate Bauer here doing great work on a Monday morning here on the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your I'm host, awake. Thomas Frank Carr. You're way ahead of me, man. I am, like, in third gear right now. Uh, long weekend. <laughs> um, Mike Yersich, I think the other standout yeah. person from the weekend. Mike Yersich, uh, what were your first impressions of his uh, his grand opening, let's call his first press conference more of a soft opening where we got to know him a little bit. It seemed like the full Mike Yersich was on display on Saturday. What were your thoughts about how he came across and what he had to say about the offense? Yeah, I, I think that so I had an opportunity to, to uh, have a Zoom interview with him for the magazine, for that preseason magazine by now, 166 pages. Um, yeah, I know, right? I'm. I'm figuring this out no he he held a lot of the same characteristics at this press conference on saturday as he did in june when i interviewed him for that magazine which is to say you know i i think that he had a confidence about him in his introductory press conference but mm -hmm. maybe was a little more um willing to uh, What's the word? Walk on eggshells is not the, the right way to... He's a little it, more reserved. A little more reserved. A little more right? cautious like with who he was, well, I think, the first time. Right. You know, you, you've never met the media. You, you've never, you, you don't know uh, the people asking the questions. Yeah. Uh, it's, your first, it's your first day on the job, right? You don't, you don't want to make a splash. Uh, and so I, I thought that there were elements of that initial press conference where he was assertive. But in June, when I talked to him, it was it, like... Boom. Like, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Get on board or don't. I don't care. Like, that That was really kind of the uh, the bravado to it. And I think that he held that again on Saturday. Uh, you know, just kind of saying, look, uh, somebody asked him, you know, about how long it's going to take for, for the offense to be as good as he wants it to be, <laughs> which is – a legitimate question. It's a it's a legitimate question. We saw it in 2016. Yep. Joe Moorhead did not come in and sprinkle some fairy dust and have a top 10 offense uh, yeah. overnight. Like that's not how that worked. By the way, uh, he had some of the most talented players that are currently in the NFL right now. So, you right. know, it wasn't like Joe Moorhead was working with parts and pieces. That was some of the most talented offensive players that Penn State has seen in the last decade that have gone on to great success at the highest level, and it still took them a month to really get the gears going. Uh, a month and a little bit more than that, because to be honest with you, they were a play away from losing to, to Minnesota, Yeah, right? A couple of plays away to losing to Minnesota, and you know, God shone down on Beaver Stadium uh, against Ohio State that, that night, but mm -hmm. not like the offense lit it up that night. That was not a, a, a tremendous offensive performance. So, it was like 10-6 nah, I mean, at halftime, or it was something. Yeah, it, it was 7-6, was yeah, uh, or some very, very conservative game on both sides. Exactly, exactly. So, nah, but, you, you know, it's just it's just how our mind uh, changes perception of, of what things were and are. Yeah. So so you know that Mike Yersich has his hands full. They, they have their hands full in terms of being able to get to where they want to be right off the bat. But at the same time, what other option is there, <laughs> right? Like, right. There, there is only one answer to that question, it's, and he said it, which is, look, we got to be as good as we can possibly be right off the bat because yeah. you're going to Wisconsin. Wisconsin's going to be a tough game. Like, there is there is no preseason. There is no warm-up to this. There yeah. is no uh, gradual escalation of, of the quality of opponent. And so – it's it's all about getting as much in right now and doing it as well as you possibly can right off the bat. And and I thought I thought he was effective. I, I really did. I thought that he, um, you know, look, he he's a confident guy. He is he has what a lot of people around him would describe, I think, as an infectious personality. Yeah, loves football. It's authentic. You could you could hear how it was authentic. And that's one thing in, in just a second, I want you to finish your thought, but that's the one thing that I came across with. He's a very authentic person. Very, very much so. And, and not to diminish my own or our own role, role in the media, but these guys don't care about the media. Like 
Mike Yurcich of anybody cares about what the media thinks and fans think the least, right? Like, uh-huh. because he knows that their perceptions will be shaped exclusively by their performance. Yep. And the best way for Penn State to perform offensively is to be 100% locked in on his players, right? Yep. And the rest of the coaching staff. And put all your focus, put all of your energies into that. Uh, it, it just, right now, it's August. We're just talking. Yep. And Mike Yersich is a guy who very, very clearly uh, is not one for talking. That's not his deal. I loved your comment that he was like a Will Ferrell character that didn't know the volume of his voice. Cause, because yeah, you... that, that, was, that was perfect. Because that, I, was, I was sitting here and, and what happened? I was at a, a family event this weekend. And yesterday I was getting caught up on everything and I was doing two, two or three things at once. And I had our video at the YouTube page of Mike Yersich on in the background and I had to stop what I was doing and go over and I had to watch the video because it seemed like he was yelling at people. Like he was, he was intense. And the thing that I, that the reason I think the authenticity came through is because that wasn't intentional. When he starts talking about football, he just gets excited. And if there's one thing that I think fans and like I identify with personally is the I get super excited. Sometimes I get super worked up when we're talking about football. And that's what Mike Yersich was on Saturday where he was he started in the middle of it. Nate, I was saying this. He started coaching the media when he was asked a question. He started like getting into coach speak and not just specifically what he was, you know, saying, but the way he was saying it of like uh, he was in the huddle. He was coaching the the running backs and the quarterbacks on what we need to do on this particular play and be locked in and focus. I was like, he's he forgot where he was. He is so in coach mode right now during camp that it it just he just slipped right into it and I think that authenticity should play really well with his players and I think eventually as as you pointed out if he's successful that will absolutely play with fans because we're all looking for that connection of what makes us think that we're like those people and what makes us think that we're a part of this and that we share this common bond of football and when you have guys that feel like you screaming in the stands you you attach to that and i thought that was really interesting it was really fun to like even if i wasn't there to be able to watch and to see that kind of passion just slip out of mike yersich yeah i what was interesting to me was then seeing him on the practice field yeah because that was the element that i had not yet been able to witness and so look i I didn't get to see kirk shiraka last year ever i never never got to see him practice uh coach practice I have some suspicions about what that was like, and I, I think there are many, many ways to do this. Uh, but but my suspicion is Kirk's kind of a quiet guy and, yep. you know, just goes about his business, and that's that's the way that he leads, and that's the way that he coaches. Uh, Mike Yersich was like 100% annoyed a hundred percent of the time <laughs> that I watched him. And now, and I think, I think that this is, I think that this is important because people will read into that and say, Oh, well uh, the offense stinks. Penn state's offense isn't where it needs to be right now. Right. No, I don't think that's it at all. I think it's that his standard is exacting. And yeah. the way that he projects that to his players is by being forceful, by being like, no matter what it is, he is assertive about what he wants to say. And so that doesn't like, even when he's paying a compliment, it sounds like he's ticked off. <laughs> it sounds like, it's like <clears throat> way to go. Great throw. You know, like it, yeah. it's just, that's, that's just, that's kind of the aura uh, that he has, but I think it's effective. I think it's effective. And, and, you know, I I think that, I think that it does translate to uh, the players and, you know, we'll see, we'll see how, how they actually perform uh, this season. And then whether or not that's something that fans like, right. Is, is going to be directly tied to whether or not they win football games, right. Ultimately that's what it's about. 
Yep, perception is always based on that. That's either he's a fiery, passionate guy or he's overbearing, and that's just based on the results of what happens. So you're absolutely right, right about that. Uh, Nate Bauer, editor, Blue White Illustrated, uh, our star of the show today. Thank you so much for coming in and giving us your impressions of, of camp and of media day. I cannot wait to be with you there as we go through the rest of training camp and the regular season. So thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is fun. All right, that's it for the BWI Daily Edition. And again, if you want to see all of Nate's comments about what he saw, we didn't get to everything, including the offensive line, Noah Kane, all of that, bwi.rivals.com backslash subscribe. This is the BWI Daily Edition. Get it wherever you get to your podcasts and on YouTube.